of David, a psalm. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty, from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is the word of God. O Lord, our God, as we come now to hear what you have to say to us, please, by your spirit, open our hearts and minds that we might listen and obey. Father, help me to preach faithfully according to what you purpose that we might hear and know of you and of the world in which we live. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Walk into any shopping centre in any city around the world at the moment and you'll know that Christmas is just around the corner. They were doing it in Singapore when we were there, setting up the decorations. They were doing it in Japan as well. I'm sure they've been doing it in Sydney while we've been away. They were putting up their Christmas decorations. They were playing jolly jingle music. They were selling their Christmas wares, even in October. It's getting earlier each year, isn't it? Christmas is just around the corner. And it's easy to be weary of the crass commercialism of Christmas, but I want to say this morning that Christmas is worth celebrating because Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a very simple reason to celebrate a very important season. Christmas is worth celebrating because Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the King and Saviour of mankind. He is our High Priest, our Prophet and our King. He rescues the perishing, he heals the brokenhearted and he restores the hope of his people. He is the lover of our souls He's made atonement for our sins. And to all who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God so that we can dwell with him forever in God's new creation. Today, Jesus is seated at God's right hand in heaven from where he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We read a bit about that in Luke's uh, reading this morning, and there's more of that in Psalm 110 today. One day soon he will put an end to all evil by crushing Satan's head and bringing God's kingdom in forever. And These are just some of the reasons why Christmas is still worth celebrating. So today we're going to look at one of the great passages of the Bible. Psalm 110 is all about Jesus. And since we'll soon be in the season of Advent, it's the perfect time to remind ourselves of the reason for the season. Advent means the arrival or the coming of Christ. In other words, it tells us that Christmas is just around the corner. Officially, it starts on the 1st of December this year, uh, so we've still got, before the official season of Advent, a few weeks to go. But uh, since all the decorations are going up, we might as well think about that now as well. Advent is meant to be a joyful time of the year. It's a time for renewing our faith and hope in God as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Saviour Jesus, and therefore it's also a time for sharing the gospel and for telling others about the King of Glory. Who is this King of Glory? He is Jesus Christ the Lord. He is David's greater son, who is now ruling as God's eternal King. So I've got these four points to share with you this morning as we look at Psalm 110. And as you can see, these four points are all about Jesus because this whole psalm is all about Jesus. 
because Jesus is David's greater son. So Jesus is, first of all, the exalted Messiah in verse 1. He is the kingly Messiah in verses 2 and 3. He is the priestly Messiah in verse 4. And he is the victorious Messiah in verses 5 to 7. The exalted Messiah, the kingly Messiah, the priestly Messiah, the victorious Messiah. And this tells us that Christmas is still worth celebrating because Jesus' birth is the moment when this prophecy became history, when God entered into our world, became one of us, and took upon himself the duty, the calling, as it were, to obey God to the very end by laying his own life down in our place on the cross. Jesus fulfilled through his life, death, resurrection and reign all the promises of God in our passage today. The birth of Jesus is the moment when this prophecy began to become history and that's again why Christmas is still worth celebrating today. First of all then, Jesus is the exalted Messiah in verse 1. He is lifted up to the highest place. So often our world wants to pull people down. But Jesus is exalted and lifted up. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. For us today, this statement of faith comes as no great surprise because we already know that Jesus is God's exalted Messiah. We may know it in our heads, we hear it, it's taught at church all the time. Jesus is God's exalted Messiah. That's, after all, why we're Christians. We know that God has exalted Jesus to the highest place. He is now seated at God's right hand in heaven from where he reigns in glory at the Father's side. In the book of Philippians, we're told that he took on the nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Everyone's going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Everyone is going to bow before him and say, yes, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is what David foresaw as he writes in verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And this outcome of Christ's exaltation was achieved through his obedience to the Father's will, that he, though he was very God, became one of us. And worse than that, having taken on flesh, was convicted, was unjustly tried, and then nailed to a cross. He was utterly humiliated to the very lowest place. And if you know the creed, it says, and he descended into hell. He went to the very depths. He experienced everything that it is possible to experience as a human being so that we might be saved from that worst of outcomes, an eternity separated from God. He did it out of love for us, out of love for his Father, because he is our God and it is a wonderful thing indeed. So today we know that Jesus is God's exalted Messiah, but before the birth of Jesus, the question of his identity remained somewhat of a mystery. The people knew that the Messiah had to be a son of David. They knew that he had to come from David's genealogical line, but they didn't understand that the Messiah would also be the son of God. This is not what they expected, that the Messiah would be God with us. And so they were confounded by this mystery How can David call him my Lord, who is not the Lord God himself? The only solution is that the Messiah has to be more than a man. In fact, a perfect man. A man who's not only David's son, but David's Lord. 
David was Israel's greatest king and yet here he acknowledges the reign of a higher king, a king who achieves the final victory of God and then all his enemies are to be placed under his feet. For the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Before Jesus was arrested and crucified, he challenged the Pharisees on this very point. Let me read to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, beginning in verse 41. It'll be on the screen as well. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And rightly so. Every Jew knew that the Messiah would be a son of David. But then Jesus challenged them in their understanding of the Messiah's full identity. So he asked them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, if David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? It should be the son calling his father Lord, not the father calling his son my Lord. Do you see the problem? Why would David call his son my Lord? So Jesus challenged them on their understanding of the Messiah's full identity. Whose son is he really? And the Pharisees, they had no answer for this challenging question. I love the description of what happens next in verse 46. No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. It was checkmate. The Pharisees were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. Although they'd seen the miracles and heard his teachings, they clung to their own prejudices and they ignored God's word, even when he was standing right in front of them. They denied the fact that Jesus could be both son of God and son of man. They denied Jesus' identity. They denied Jesus' authority. And they denied the implication in verse 1 that by rejecting Jesus, they were actually making themselves enemies of God and subjects of God's wrath. It's awful to say it, but they were spiritually dead. And that's why they wanted to nail Jesus to a cross. The truth was revealing himself to them, but they didn't believe him. The living word of God was speaking to them, but they weren't listening. Instead, they rejected their Messiah, and in doing so, they rejected God himself. And sadly, I think many people do the same thing each Christmas. That is, they may sing, O little town of Bethlehem, but in their hearts, they don't believe in the Messiah's birth. It's just a myth or a fairy story. And they may sing once in royal David's city, but they don't consider receiving Jesus Christ as Lord. And so we do need to be careful about Christmas. Because very often it is that people simply aren't listening, not to the message, not to the word of who the Messiah is. So let's be ready this year as God's people in Burwood to share the truth about the exalted Messiah. Because Christmas is a great time to share the gospel And a perfect time to tell people about the King of glory, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings me to our next point for today, about the fact that Jesus is the kingly Messiah. In verse 2, Jesus is the kingly Messiah. And if you see in verse 3, there's an army, which I'm going to say to you, is his church. Here is the Messiah, and here is his holy church. By the power of his word, God is establishing his kingdom beginning in Zion. So we read in verse 2, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your youth. God had long promised that the law would go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
And so it came to pass that after Jesus gained the victory over death, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And he said to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when the disciples were all together in one place, you know what happened. Remember, there was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind from heaven which filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on the heads of each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It was the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was giving the church a sign that Jesus had begun to reign in heaven. And so the Lord himself began to extend the Messiah's mighty scepter from Zion. But the picture in Psalm 110 is even bigger than that because I think it also looks forward to the end of time when Christ gathers his elect as a holy army and begins to judge the living and the dead. So in our passage today, it is the Lord God himself who extends the scepter from Zion and so establishes Christ's rule in the midst of his enemies. And isn't that what the church is? The church is God's beachhead in the midst of an unbelieving world. It is the establishing of his kingdom on earth. And we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's incumbent upon us as God's people to be willing to honour and obey and follow our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that it is God who extends the Messiah's scepter. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. It's the Lord, the Father, speaking to his Son, the Messiah. And you can see the relationship is so close between God the Father and God the Son that the two cannot be separated. To know Jesus is to know God. To follow Jesus is to follow God. To trust in Jesus is to trust in God. It's a package deal and it's sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. So the Trinity is at work in Psalm 110. The question for us though is, as verse 3 says, are you willing to fight the good fight of faith? To be willing on the day of battle? Are you willing to serve under the banner of your king? Are you willing to defend the truth of the gospel? Are you willing to pray for the growth of his kingdom? See, the Christian life has many challenges, but it has many privileges too. I want to draw your attention to a particular privilege in verse 3. It's a bit of a cryptic verse, a difficult one to translate. What we have before us in our translation is this arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth there are other translations that are possible but what i see here is a picture of the church triumphant the church triumphant here we stand before our risen king arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn from the first light of day And as the sun rises on this mighty army, wow, look at this, the redeemed of the Lord. There we are, like dew, a million drops of dew on the grass in the early morning. So great is the number, it's beyond counting. This is the church triumphant. The church victorious and glorious, and it's another reason why Christmas is still worth celebrating. May God use us this Christmas to his glory. May we be willing, as Christ wants us to be willing, to fight the good fight of faith. And may the Holy Spirit fill us afresh and sanctify us and equip us for the good works he has prepared for us to do. Yes, we're planning for an outreach on the 14th of December, and we pray that we can get that happening. How can we fight the good fight of the faith in Burwood? We need God's help to do that. And we have set before us in Psalm 110 a promise of what God's plan and purpose is. So may the love of Jesus be in our hearts and may his name be on our lips this Christmas. 
So far today, we've seen that Jesus is the exalted Messiah and that Jesus is the kingly Messiah. My third point is that he is also the priestly Messiah. Let's have a look at his priestly role in verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is the mysterious Melchizedek. He's only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. There's once in Genesis chapter 14, that's where Abraham uh, meets with Abraham and there's worship of the Lord that happens in Genesis 14. And here again in Psalm 110. Without introduction, without equal, without explanation, Melchizedek simply is. He is a pre-Jewish priest king. He's a mysterious man to whom Abraham gives a tithe and from whom he receives a blessing. He really is an international man of mystery. But here's the thing that's important for us today. Melchizedek makes possible the fact that Jesus is a priest king too. Jesus has to be a priestly Messiah to save us from our sins because only priests can make atonement for sin. Only priests can mediate between sinful people and a holy God. So for Jesus to be our mediator, he has to be a priest. But then how can he be a priest if he doesn't belong to the priestly tribe of Levi? Well, he can if he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You see, Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. And his ministry as a priest to God Most High points us straight to Jesus. But when we find Melchizedek talking to Abraham back in Genesis 14, it's like finding a computer in Tutankhamun's tomb. He is such an unusual find, as it were, so far ahead of his time that his life and ministry can't be explained until you meet Jesus. First, his name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. That's what his name means, King of Righteousness, Melchizedek. Second, he is the King of Salem, for that was his city. Now Salem is Jerusalem, which is also David's city, but this was long before David was born. Third, Salem means peace. So Melchizedek is also, as it were, the King of Peace, the King of Salem, as well as being the King of Righteousness. And fourth, He is called the priest of God Most High. He is a man so important that even Abraham gives him a tenth of all he has, showing just how great Melchizedek is. Melchizedek was, as it were, Abraham's Lord, just as David speaks of one who is my Lord in our passage today. Melchizedek, then, is the trump card for the whole argument of the gospel and how it works. A priest king who stands beyond the priestly system of Israel and is not limited by it, but has a timeless connection to God and eternal priesthood. He's so important that without him, the gospel falls apart. Melchizedek's ministry settles the issue. And so we see in Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you, Messiah, to come, you, Messiah are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. God is connecting for us in our passage today the dots of salvation history. We need to understand where they lead. The book of Hebrews sums it up for us in its seventh chapter. It says this, speaking of Melchizedek as a forerunner of Christ, such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, for he sacrificed for our sins once for all when he offered himself. So he is a great high priest who is sinless in himself and is able to offer himself as a sacrifice for us so that we can be counted as sinful too. Sinless too. Let me get that right. (laughs) Jesus is the one true mediator between God and man. That's the point. He stands in the middle and he's able to do that. And that's why salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. 
Only Jesus can bring all these things together under one head. The exalted Messiah who transcends all human expectations about the Christ. The kingly Messiah who fulfills the hopes of his father David. And the priestly Messiah who stands in the order of Melchizedek and renders the old Levitical system obsolete sacrificing his own life once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. This is profound. This is deep. This is how the gospel works. At every point, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament expectations so that we, though we are sinful, can draw near to God by faith in him. He is our king, but he serves us in love. He is our high priest, but he sacrifices his life to save us. He is our Lord and God. He is our saviour and our friend, and he blesses all who trust in him for eternal life. Who is this king of glory? He is Jesus Christ the Lord, David's greater son, who now reigns as God's eternal king. So then finally today, Jesus is and must be the victorious Messiah. In the last three verses of our psalm, we have what appears to be a prophecy of the end of the world and the beginning of the new creation. So in verse 5, The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. As I was saying this morning, this may come as a shock to you, but the gospel is not good news for everyone. The gospel is not good news for everyone. We believe in the reality of God's judgment, and well should we, because there is so much evil in the world that if there was not judgment, then how could God be fair? How could he be right? And if we believe in judgment, then we also believe in the penalty of hell, an eternal separation from God. We don't speak about it very often, do we? But we should speak about it more, for it is a danger that hangs over many heads in our world today. A day is coming when anyone and everyone who choose to oppose God and reject his Messiah will face judgment. From Satan to the demons the kings and rulers of this world, anyone who turns their back on God. And the tragedy is they'll have no one to save them for they will have rejected Christ. Don't let this be you. God's judgment is real because he is holy and righteous. But God's love is greater than all human sinfulness. Jesus died in your place. And now offers you forgiveness. Don't let pride stop you turning to Jesus. Don't let fear or shame get in the way of confessing your sins. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus is the victorious Messiah. And his victory will be complete. In the book of Revelation, there is a similar scene. I want to share some of it with you now. It comes from Revelation chapter 14. This is what John sees in his vision. Apart from the overthrow of many kings, he says this, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. The Lamb is not alone. For standing with him on Mount Zion is the church of the redeemed who are are known by the Father and are loved by the Son. And they've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb and not one of them is missing. Their number is complete. All of them are glorious and victorious and standing before their King. And John says, They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. The perfect number. 12 times 12 times 1,000. All the redeemed in their completeness. The whole church of God. 
And I think to myself, that's where I want to be. I want to be where they are. I want to be like them. I want to stand on Mount Zion with Jesus. I want to feel the wind in my hair and the grass under my feet and I want to sing for joy. I want to be pure and blameless. I want to be undefiled in the presence of the Lamb. You see, the gospel is great news for those who come to Jesus. It's terrible news for those who reject him. Coming back to Psalm 110, look again at verse 7. It's a little bit obscure, but my gut feel is that it's talking about the river of life and the hope of the resurrection. For the brook beside the way is a place that gives strength and refreshment to the king, enabling him to lift up his head and gain the final victory. And so today we celebrate his victory as his people. We look forward to the coming of the new creation, where there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away, for Christ will have won the victory. And for me, that's just another reason why Christmas is still worth celebrating. So today, in Psalm 110, God's word has led us into the presence of David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the exalted Messiah. Let's lift him up in our own hearts and minds. He is the kingly Messiah. Let us be quick to obey him, submit to his rule. He is the priestly Messiah. Let us be thankful for God's grace for giving us such a great mediator. And he is the victorious Messiah, which means that we can look forward to all that he's planned and purposed for us. So let's take Christmas back this year. The season of Advent, which is soon to come, is meant to be a joyful time. Let's recover the joy of Christmas. It's a time for renewing our faith and hope in God. Let's do that as well. It's also a time for sharing the gospel and for telling others about the King of glory in whom we have placed our hope, the one who's been exalted to God's right hand and who has the victory ready to share with us. Secondly, Psalm 110 reminds us that the birth of Jesus is about much more than just the birth of a baby boy. No, it's about God being God, entering into our world, taking our sin upon himself, taking our penalty in his place. It's about the judgment of sin, yes, but it's about the resurrection and the hope that is also there. God's mercy, God's grace is rich. So let us be mindful of the truth about Christmas. It's one thing to say Jesus is Lord, but is he, as David calls him, my Lord? Is he your Lord? Jesus, my Lord. Amen, sister. Jesus is my Lord. Can you say that today? If you can't, then you need to settle your accounts with God. You can be near to heaven and say, Jesus is Lord. Do you have that personal relationship? If you call him Lord, then honour him as your Lord. Bring your life under his sovereign rule. Set aside the things that you make priorities of and let him govern and order those priorities for you. If you hear him speaking to you in his word, then listen. Don't be like the Pharisees who refused to let Jesus into their hearts and be saved, even though they knew he was speaking the truth to them. Don't stay stuck in the valley of decision. Make a decision. Take your stand with Jesus. Be there on Mount Zion. For Jesus is coming soon and his reward is with him. And finally, meditate on these things and pray. Pray for one another. Pray for the saving of many lives this Christmas. Pray that God will reignite our hearts with his love. Pray that he might give us a fresh desire to reach out to people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Pray that he'll give us a new understanding of his will for our lives. And pray for the courage to live it out 
to his praise and glory. Yes, Christmas is worth celebrating. Let's celebrate it this year as God would have us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that Jesus is, all that Jesus has done, and all that we look forward to in the new creation. In this world there are many troubles, but you have them under control. You have a plan and you are working it out. Lord, draw us into that precious place. Draw us into the loving arms of Jesus. Forgive us all that we have done. Cleanse us, restore us, anew us. Help us to love you. Help us to believe. For truly, we want to say to you today, Jesus is my Lord. Amen.